I thought an appropriate question as we've gathered in this place is this. What makes a good church? You ever thought of that? You ever evaluate different churches? What makes a good church? Is it the coffee? As long as the coffee is at least standard with Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, you know, maybe even the coffee is so good I don't have to bring my own. That's what we're striving for, by the way. Um, Maybe that's what makes a good church. Is it the children's ministry? That I have little ones who wake up and they drag me to church. They say, I cannot miss what's going on. The children's ministry is so great, I have to be there. Is that it? Is it the music? That the music just stirs our soul. That it gets us in the right mood to consider the things of God and it is just on point. Is it helicopters? That a church is known for, on Easter, dropping eggs from the sky through the use of helicopter power. Uh, maybe that's what makes a good church. Or, or how about this one? This one makes me a little bit nervous. Is it the pastor? That he is a good preacher and semi-relatable, not too quirky. Is that what makes a good church? I bring this all up not only because we're gathered in church, but also because it's a very interesting time at our local church, Amazing Love. See, right now we have called for a second pastor, and uh, Pastor Jeff Gunn, just a great guy. And another thing that happened is that um, I also received a call uh, to serve in Overland Park, Kansas. And so it is a time of introspection where really we've been forced to evaluate, you know, what do we want for the church, and and what do other churches want, and, and what makes a good church? And in the process, you know, I I see God's handiwork. I have a high regard for God placing people where he wants them to be. He uses a congregation, but it's a divine thing when a pastor is in a certain place. He's ultimately appointed by God, even though working through a congregation. And so as a pastor, it makes me think, what should church be all about? Can I let you what I think makes a good church? Here's my answer. That you see Jesus. That you see Jesus. That when you come to church, you know that the cross of Jesus covers every sin. That when you come to this place, you're coming not because you have it all cleaned up, but because you're broken. And you see in Jesus the answer you need for any guilt, any shame, and you know you can have peace with God. That when you come on Easter, you see an empty tomb, and you know that empty tomb, it speaks about your own life. And it speaks about the fact that you too will rise because Jesus rose. That when you see Jesus, he's going to tell you about the life that is truly life. And that's not just someday in heaven, it's every day when you get to walk with him and know he's there and guiding you and working everything for the good. That you see Jesus that truly there's no love better, a love that is unfailing, a love that is conditional, and you find in him the best thing the world has to offer. I think that if a church gives you Jesus as Savior, that's a good church. I consider this when the psalmist wrote these words. In Psalm 34, it says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And it really has this idea of trying to enlarge Jesus in our mind, enlarge the Lord in our mind, that he looms so large that everything else is blocked out. If he looms so large and I get to see his love, his presence, his power, that I start putting everything else aside, the mundane things of life, the problems of life, that that if he's so large in my mind, I can finally be at peace. And so what do we do at Amazing Love? We try to share with you Jesus. And so I wanted to welcome you again if you're just joining us online, um, if you're new in this place. If you see him for who he is, you'll never want anything else. He's so beautiful, he's going to knock your socks off. But I consider what's at stake as I was reading a a church book, so I I know this is my world, but I want to let you in. It was a book called Lead by Paul David Tripp. And, um, and he warned that some churches get so focused on achievement that they lose the essence of what it is to be a gospel community. 
that sometimes as, as churches grow and build, they get more about the vision and more about stats and more about numbers and planning, that it becomes more and more about the administration, almost like a, a corporation, than it has to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, this is one of the warnings he had. He he was a pastor for a long time. He said, when humble gospel passionate pastors, preachers and leaders over time morph into intentionally focused administrators or vision casters, they tend to lose some of their gospel passion. And the church or ministry suffers as a result. This spoke to me as we were thinking of building as a church body because we could just focus on numbers. We could just focus on the better programming and the better music and the better colors and all the things of this world, but we can't get away from what the church is all about. Salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the jewel we have to offer. Because if people know today that through a gift of God they are saved, it is then that they can have peace like none other. Now, to be clear, it doesn't mean that the other things don't matter. We want coffee that's better than Starbucks. We want music that knocks your socks off. We want all those things to be done as best as possible, but we never want to lose the power of the church. I'm reminded of this not just by Paul David Tripp, but by another Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul. And he was writing to another congregation in the town of Corinth, and, and he was talking about how the pastor doesn't really matter. And that might be a shocking statement to you, but the pastor of your church doesn't really matter. That's what he was saying. Uh, And this is the words that he said. He said, What after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Why does a church grow? Because God allows it to grow. And among pastors, even though he uses them, The Holy Spirit's telling you, it's it's not about the pastor. (laughs) You get to know any pastor up close and personal, he will not knock your socks off. (laughs) He'll be really, really human, whatever your experience is. But Jesus always will. And we can put in the list, it's not just then about a pastor, it's also not about the programming, and it's not about the music, and it's not about all the peripheral. It is about God who makes his church grow. So that's what I want to meditate in these moments today of what then it is to build on Jesus. If you agree with my premise that a good church is all about Jesus, then then what would a community, what would our lives look like if we just dedicated ourselves to being that type of community and that type of people? And so we're going to hear this uh, based on the words from 1 Peter. Uh, So Peter, who has changed through the resurrection of Jesus, is going to lead us into this discussion of what it is to build on that chief cornerstone, the church's one foundation. And something we do in honor of the word of God, because we do believe God is speaking, is we just stand as we hear the words of God uh, from 1 Peter. Uh, So here it is. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of any kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. These are powerful words. We could dwell in them for days. Um, Before you sit down, though, could you just say out loud or to a neighbor, build on Jesus. Build on Jesus. Thank you so much. Please be seated. So I'm just curious, uh, maybe a raise of hands. Um, How many of you are label readers when you eat something? So you read the label 
before you put it in your body. And, and, and there, there are many reasons to do that, right? Um, one of the reasons is for caloric intake. You know, if you've ever been part of Weight Watchers or, you know, trying to, you know, see how many calories you're taking in, um, you, you read how many calories. I'm always surprised at a bag of, of candy. I, I really love, like, uh, peach gummies. And, and, like, there's six serving sizes in that bag. And I'm like, oh, man, I, I wish it was, like, two because they're delicious. And I eat the whole bag. But anyway, um, some of you might not just do it for calories, but you do it because you're wondering about clean eating. And you've learned about clean eating, that clean eating is uh, eating chicken because chicken is chicken, and apples because apples are apples. But soda and uh, microwave dinners um, have all these chemicals in them. And, and so you might be trying to avoid all of the chemically enhanced foods. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done any research on aspartame. And is aspartame good for you? Um, I know that it's made up by science, amino acids and things like that, but, but adding aspartame to a diet soda or to sparkling water, um, is that really good? And, and maybe you're watching your aspartame intake. I don't know about you. Well, if you can relate to this on any level, whether for calories or chemicals or for a special kind of diet, on a higher level, what God is telling you today is be very, very careful what you take in. Not in your body, but in your soul. What he is warning you is about taking in anything that would be mixed, anything that would be unpure, anything that would be adulterated when it comes to the messaging of the word. And this is what um, Peter said. These are his words. He said, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. And so here, Peter has this idea um, that to build on Jesus, and this is the first takeaway, you want to pursue a pure teaching. You want to make sure that whatever is being taught, whatever you're led to believe, and we hear messages all the time, it is not enhanced through worldly thought. And it's not enhanced by the thoughts of men. And it's not enhanced by tradition. It, it needs to be the pure word of God so that you might grow up in your salvation. Now, now the reason this matters, and, and I know it's, we're kind of focusing on church, so again, welcome, by the way, if you are in church. Um, but it matters a lot from my perspective. So can I just tell you something as a pastor? I see all the time that false teaching hurts people. I'm going to say it again. I see all the time that false teaching hurts people. I remember being in Starting Point, and um, I would sit across the table with, with people who had a religious experience, and they would say to me these words, and it's happened more than once, Pastor, in our church, we never got into the Bible. We never talked about these things. We never opened the Bible. And it made me wonder, what did you talk about? And, and how could you be truly led by the Spirit? I remember sitting across people with tears in their eyes because they were hurt by the church. And they would tell me, in our church, they looked at our tax statements and, and from our adjusted gross income, they put 10% and they basically handed us a bill and made us feel like this is our responsibility. This is the bill that we got for being in the church of God. Versus understanding that God loves a, a joyful, a cheerful giver who doesn't give reluctantly or in a compulsion. The, the one that maybe sticks out to me the most, I remember being in men's group. And uh, Dan, I don't know if you remember this. Um, we were doing men's fraternity. And we came in, it was about Christmas time. And um, the, the presenter of this curriculum basically said, if you haven't prayed this prayer, you might not be a Christian. And it was so interesting because that day, all the men came in believing in Jesus. But that one word was enough to make them pause and ask, well, maybe I'm not a believer because I'm not sure I've ever prayed that prayer. Let me say it again. False teaching hurts people. And it's going on all the time. There are, there are churches, and we're not any better, we're just trying to pursue God, but there are churches who don't call sin, sin, and that hurts people. There are churches that say, believe your feelings and your experience over the revealed word of God, and that hurts people and leads them astray. And so Peter, 
It says, pursue the pure teaching, unadulterated. You know, I was thinking of an analogy, um, talking about food, and I was thinking of what it was to go to a restaurant. And, and, and let's say that you love everything about this restaurant. You love the style. It, it, it's 2021. You love the customer service, and they treat you like family. You love the food, and every dish you had was excellent. I mean, as tasty as possible. And yet, at this restaurant, there's a bit of poison in the food. And because of that bit of poison, you get a little bit sick. And as you continue to go back, you get a little sicker as the poison builds up in your system. But you keep going back because you, you love, again, the ambiance. And you love how you're treated. And it tastes so good. But you're getting sicker each time. Would you go to the restaurant that you know serves you poison and is making you sick? Anyone sound like a good idea? Can you track with me today just from a pastoral lens? We live in a culture that says as long as the church has the peripheral, as long as the ambiance is good and they treat me like family and, and everything tastes really good, at least in that moment, I can put up with a little bit of poison. I can put up with a little bit of false teaching because, eh. But what I see is that over time what happens is that Christians slowly get sick and sometimes without even knowing it. And so pursue pure teaching. But the question you might have for me as pastor is, Pastor, this all sounds good, and, and of course I don't want to ingest any poison, but how do I do that? <laughs> it's a really good question. It's a really good question. And we actually have modeled in the New Testament examples for how to do that. Our examples are from Berea, the Berean Christians. And look at what it says about the Christians in Berea. It said, The Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, can you imagine that? Paul is a pretty reliable source. If he was leading a church, it would be, a, yeah, that's a good church. And yet Christians in Paul's congregation went back and they made sure to use the plumb line of God's word and made sure to fact check Paul so that they weren't getting any poison. What this means is that we are never done learning the word of God. We are never done reading the word of God, investigating that whatever we're taking in is from him and not the world and not the traditions and not just man speak. What also we can do is what Peter talked about, which is build on the cornerstone. I had to do some research because I'm not much of a builder. Um, but a cornerstone was used to make everything else straight. If it was in the proper place, the whole building could be straight. But if the cornerstone was off, everything else was off. And so what we do as far as the cornerstone here, we make sure that Jesus is the focal point. He's the one, the word made flesh, that makes everything else straight. But as we continue into the words of Peter, there is a beautiful promise. This promise that if you build on Jesus and if you sink this truth in your soul, it is so um, peace-giving. It is so great, so phenomenal. Uh, so I want to share that with you. And, and to set it up... Um, I was listening to a devotion this past week. I shared it on my Facebook page. It was by a Time of Grace Ministry. And by the way, if you're ever looking for like good personal devotions, uh, this Your Time of Grace Ministry is so great, uh, a way to hear devotions. And, and I, I love this devotion probably because they were talking about movies. And uh, he was referencing Back to the Future 2. Uh, who, who's seen Back to the Future 2? Who likes Back to the Future 2? Yeah. And he was referencing this fact that um, in the movie, there was a man named Biff um, who got a sports almanac, went back in time using a sports almanac from the future to bet on games. And because he had that almanac from the future, he became very powerful, he became very rich, because everything he bet on, he won. And you consider what it was to be Biff going back, watching those games, it didn't matter how many points the team was up by. He knows, as bad as it looks, who wins the game. He knows the outcome. 
And I love this because, Christian, do you know that God has given you an almanac? He has given you something that tells you how it's going to work out. In fact, one of the the great words that we see in this lesson is from Peter. When he says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen precious cornerstone, and the one entrusts in him will never be put to shame. The almanac, so to speak, is trust in Jesus. And if you live your lives trusting in his word, trusting in his promises, banking on him, this is what he says, you win. And it doesn't matter how the devil makes it look. It doesn't matter how weak you feel. If you have stepped out in faith, it's going to work out. And so here's the next takeaway. To build on Jesus is to believe that acts of faith work out. And I guess that's so important because I don't know if you've ever lived in fear of the naysayers or those who say, I told you so. Have you ever been reluctant to move in a relationship or buying a house or a car because you're afraid of mom or dad or a friend saying, I told you so? I brought up the NFL draft, and and if you're a Bears fan and you go back to, you know, Trubitsky versus Mahomes, I I wonder if there are any I told you sowers going on, right, who who thought they had the crystal ball, right? And and it can make us very trepidatious to do anything because what if we're wrong? But what I find is that when it comes to the future and living in faith to God, what people will say is not I told you so. No, they'll ask, how did you know? When when you did that, how did you know it was going to work out? How did you know that that you were going to go there and do that thing and and that God was, how how did you know? But but this is how I think it works. I think God invites us to have faith go first. So so when it comes to, to finances, I know there are many people who maybe hear a message on giving to God. And and maybe they haven't trusted God with their wealth before. Or maybe they haven't been completely generous and they're hearing, no, it's going to work out if you're generous. He he knows how to provide. You can't outgive the giver. And and, and what he'll allow you to do is to have your faith go first. He he won't always project how it's going to work out. He's going to invite you to trust him so that you can see he can provide. What this means, if you're in a relationship, maybe it's with friends or people or a significant other, he's going to let you pursue and honor him in your relationships. Whether it be by trying to find a Christian spouse or friends, and all along the way, as the world maybe laughs at you for Christian values, as the world, um, yeah, doesn't understand the choices you make, as you seek to honor God, He can work that out. He can work that out. When it comes to the future and and wondering, you know, will this move for me, seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, will it work out? Will Will I still have all that I need? Will I have the strength that I need? Will I have the finances that I need? How how will it work out? He invites you to let your faith go first. But then he promises that it's going to work out. That you're going to be like Biff holding the almanac. God, you're good on your promises, aren't you? But here we see our faith and its incompleteness. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I want a safety net. God, I'm willing to trust you, but could you just give me like a hint that it works out? God, I'm willing to do that thing, but but could you give any evidence, Right? And it's so hard to step out on faith, to trust when you don't yet see. More than that, when when it comes to the ideologies of the world, it's sometimes hard to seek Jesus above all things. Because here's the thing, we love Jesus, we love forgiveness, but if we're honest, we don't always believe everything he teaches If we're honest, when it comes to the Bible, we have some skepticism that may be from the world and it may be from our hearts. And and it's sometimes hard to trust Jesus, not as Savior, but trust him in the ways of life. 
something I want to remind you of is if you really love Jesus, you have to love what he taught. You have to obey what he says is good. That, that is true love. And so we repent for all the times that we don't lead in faith because we're waiting for the safety net. And we repent of the times where we let the world dictate actions versus the word of God dictate our actions. And you know what we do? We find comfort in Jesus' story. Because Jesus' story was this. On a day we call Good Friday, it looked like the devil had won. And it looked that sin couldn't be overcome. It looked like all the leaders were right and and, and could tell the disciples, I told you so, he was not the Messiah. It looked as if Jesus Christ were being put to shame. Until three days later, when the I told you so's flipped. And those who were pointing fingers saying, I told you so, were shocked. How did you know? How did you know this was the Savior of the world, the Messiah? How did you know he was going to rise on the third day? How did you know? See, on Easter morning, the bright glory of that morning eclipsed the gloomy darkness of Good Friday, and it flipped the I told you so's to how do you know, and this is our God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that faith in him is not in vain. And what it means for you, that you can know your sins are forgiven. For any time you've doubted, for any time the ways of the world were more than the ways of God, you can know he has prepared a place for you and you're going to live with him forever. You can know that he is with you now and that those who act in faith will never be put to shame. Yes, this is the good news of Jesus Christ, that through his resurrection, we have confidence that it works out for us who believe. But three takeaways before we go. See, see, Peter said that the cornerstone is Jesus Christ and we build on him. But then as living stones, how do we act this way? And so the, the three takeaways are this. The first one is, I think, that as I'm built on Jesus, one of the things I do is I bring repentance. That, that's what I can bring in response to Jesus. I bring a repentant heart. Um, in the Old Testament, they would bring bulls and goats and doves and they would slaughter them. I'm glad we don't have to do that. But we have learned what we can bring God through the words of the psalmist. In the Psalms, it say this, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. When you come to the church of God and you just confess that you need forgiveness, you prop up the glory and beauty of the cross and Jesus Christ all the more. When you cry out to heaven, help, our helper loves to answer and give what we need, and that is God glorifying. So we come together constantly as people who prop up the name of Jesus by just giving our repentance. In fact, Martin Luther, his first of the 95 theses, said this. He said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. That we are going to continually be refined as we're struck by the the sorrow of our sin as we trust we're forgiven, but as we ask, Spirit, empower me to be changed. Spirit, empower me to do it differently. That's building on Jesus. A second takeaway. Because I'm built on Jesus, I will bring praise. How many of you parents like it when your children complain? We even have phrases to combat that, don't we? At dinner time, have you ever heard this one? You get what you get and you... Yep, right, right. Because we don't want to hear those complaints. (laughs) Um, I grew up when children were in Africa and they needed the food that we had there. And, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And and, and what about this in a company? Um, You ever have a managerial position where you work with a bunch of complainers who don't want to do their jobs? How fun is that? Super fun? Super fun times? I bring this up because it's so relatable to us. Like, we all nod our heads and we're like, yeah, 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 I I really don't like that. 
So do you know we have a manager in heaven? And, and when he looks at his people, and they're just complaining and giving excuses why they don't have to do what he said, how, how joyful is that for him? In fact, I, I was considering this as I was reading through the Bible again in Exodus, and what always strikes me in Exodus is how much the children of Israel were complainers. They were just brought out of slavery. God is feeding them with manna from heaven and quail, and, and, and they wish that they could go back to being slaves. Like, they can't, like, accept the bread from heaven, from God, like the angel bakery. Like, that's incredible, right? And how I look at us, though, and how much are you and I tempted to be just the same? To live lives where he has so abundantly blessed us with far beyond what we need and still complain about how tight things are and I don't have X, Y, and Z. To instead of living in, in focus of all the good things of life, to, to find that one bad thing and dwell, dwell there. And, and, and the, the, the things coming from our heart is just all wrapped around that one thing that, that got stuck in us. So what you can do, what we can be, let's seek to praise him on every day, to rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And one of the clearest confessions we can give to a community around us is that we act a little bit differently. See, in the book of Philippians, this is what uh, Paul said. He said this, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. <laughs> and then look what he says, You will shine among them like stars in the sky. And I was thinking of that just in traffic, and traffic always gets me. But if you would actually go out and try to be kind in traffic, people would be shocked, wouldn't they? They would be shocked when you don't get revenge for getting cut off. They would be shocked when you don't do what is so natural. That's just a light way. What if you did that in so many different arenas? Would they not be like, whoa, that's different? You were kind to me when I just like complained and treated you horribly? That's different. That's the opportunity for those who are built on Jesus. And the final takeaway. Because I'm built on Jesus, I bring my story of grace. You know what's been really interesting during COVID is all those who've had COVID and then kind of relate to different experiences. Um, you know, COVID is still going uh, through our congregation. And so whether it's be someone who has had a loved one who's sick with COVID, whether it's someone who's had a mild case, a severe case, um, you find a lot of common empathy because someone's had to wrestle with it in some way. And, uh, and so you have sometimes people who say, ah, I knew what it was to not be able to wake up for a week because I had no energy. I knew what it was to, you know, be prayerful for my loved one who was sick with it. Um, we find a, a lot of mutual ground um, because of COVID. God intends that we would find not only mutual ground there, but also in how we came through different experiences. See, on a higher plane, he, he wants Christians who are able to say, you know what, I know what it is to be sick, and I know what it is for God to have made me healthy and get through it. I know what it is to have a loved one who died, but I know what it is to have the comfort of the resurrection and for him to, to be with me during my grief. I know what it is to have a relationship gone bad, but, but then other Christians come in and say, but, but, but I also know what it is to see God's grace and make a, a new day, a better day. That's our opportunity as well. To, from our mutual suffering, help those who are suffering and tell them that God can get you through this. God is enough, and he will be faithful. The biggest story we have is that I know what it is to feel unworthy of the love of God. I know what it is to have such guilt and shame over my sin, feeling like he'd reject me. But I also know what it is to live in forgiveness and peace, to in my bones know that I have a right to be called a child of God, and so do you. That's our biggest story of grace. So as we go forward, building on Jesus, let us bring repentant hearts, praise, and our stories, our testimonies, so that the world might continue to see what the church is all about. Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. Amen.